There we go. We're recording. Wonderful. We've already had a little um, hello, which we should have recorded as well. Um, this is a dual function conversation now, is it? Because you, you're going to use some of this for some of you, your work that you're doing right now, which you can explain to me in a minute. And, and I'll also put it up on um, the Voices of the um, Regeneration conversation series. Um, so we, we're just talking about something really interesting about the, the role of um, artists, music, um, performance in accelerating the, the spread of the new narrative. Um, but I interrupted you. Well, I was just saying that on YouTube, the most popular videos are pop videos. Mm. And you can have inspiring people saying inspiring things, giving speeches and having interviews and fantastic resource that it is. But I just wonder what it would be like if you had a really good beat to it. And mm. I used to play in a band called The Dream Beat. And one of our songs was called Groove with Mission, Mission with Groove. Mm. And, and it's kind of like, um, how do you get an uh, anthem that people can sing along? I, I'm just aware of research on music and performance. Like when mm. people are doing a task, for example, if they do it to music, it kind of hums along. I, I notice that for myself if I'm gardening or washing up and I'm humming something. And, and how do we hum along to the great turning? Yeah. Um, I, in a, in a, I, I still love the, like I um, have a copy, unfortunately it's a, it's a burnt old CD from a friend of the, the Dream Beat CD. There was only one, wasn't there? Um, the, the, I, I remember that there's, there's a song on it, it's time, it's time to heal the earth. That, that was really what I was humming along to when I first went to Schumacher College and um, really got into all of this. So, so uh, case in point, that that, that um, one album that you did with Dreambeat really, um, yeah, became a soundtrack to to my early quest. Uh, uh, so, do you do music, um, Daniel? Is that one of your things you like to do? I I love music, but it's what one of the. You know how we always tell ourselves limiting stories about ourselves, and until we change that story, we, we manifest exactly what we're saying. And somehow quite early on in my life, um, my parents gave me this idea that oh, we're not a musical family. And, and so I've always loved music. I like going to live music gigs and I love dancing, um, but I, I don't play an instrument. I, I recently, in order to make this jump, I recently bought myself a steel tongue drum. Oh, okay. Which, which has this wonderful gift to people who are still trying to learn how to be musical, that, that you can't really play a steel tongue drum badly. Um, it, it just sounds nice wherever you hit. Uh -huh. But yeah, unfortunately I don't, but- um, Yet. We were saying yet. Yet, thank you. Um, and, and would, you, would you like a hot tip just to get you going? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, um, this is a Lee Oscar harmonica uh -huh. and it's in the, a minor key. Mm -hmm. And uh, I ran a course last year called Reggae Harmonica and the Growth Mindset. So mm -hmm. the growth mindset is a way of thinking about capacity and intelligence. And mm -hmm. it's in contrast to a fixed mindset. So a fixed mindset is this is how I am. You know, I'm not a musical person or I'm not good at that kind of thing. And it's a bit like we have a picture of ourselves mm -hmm. in a particular way. And people might even say things the I, like the idea of me doing that. It's not even in the picture. It's not going to happen. Uh, whereas a growth mindset is rather than a fixed picture, it's more like a movie film with frames. Mm -hmm. And when you watch a movie, what you see in the opening frames doesn't tell you what's going to happen later on. And that there's a process of change. And I'm particularly aware of this, having worked for years in the addictions recovery field, where mm -hmm. many people said, you know, I'm like this, I can't change. And yet I saw people change in front of my eyes in the most amazing and inspiring way, particularly when they stopped drinking, using drugs. It's like they discovered whole sides of themselves. And my work was really about psycho-educational work, helping people learn skills, psychological skills that help them cope with life in ways other than drink or drugs, but not just cope, actually flourish. Mm -hmm. um, and and um, 
you can apply that same growth mindset to the idea of music. Mm. And I, I set up a kind of system of music grades where grade one is you just enjoy music. Mm. Now, it's interesting. We kind of think enjoy music. That's not good enough to get a grade. But in fact, research shows when they do brain scans of people listening to music and enjoying it, there's similar parts of the brain lit up to what happens when they're playing music. And it leads to an idea that music is an active process. It's like you're constantly in your brain kind of um, going along with the tune and anticipating what might come next. And so if you enjoy music, you've got grade one. <laughs> now, grade two is, would you like to play music? Because mm -hmm. if you'd like to play music, um, desire is what gets people started on a journey. And I think of it as the call to adventure. You know, I'd love to. Um, and that's more important than playing a tune well. Um, I learned piano a bit as a, a kid and, and basically I had the enthusiasm drummed out of me. It was really boring. And my mum, when she learned piano at school, her piano teacher had a stick and used to hit her fingers if she got the wrong notes. And what you're doing there is building up negative associations with the process of playing music in order to start on something. You need to have some kind of enthusiasm. Um, Julia Cameron, who wrote the book the artist way she said enthusiasm is a better playmate than discipline mm -hmm. and it's like if you have mm -hmm. want you're going to continue so grade two is if you want to play um, an instrument so Daniel um, would you like to play an instrument absolutely I actually uh, I play around do, with it yes I do do, do, you en do you enjoy music yes you get grade one and grade two now for grade three is when you have contact with a musical instrument that makes you smile if you have a positive experience of a musical instrument early mm. on, mm. you're more likely to continue. Mm. And so just with your steel drum, do, do you smile when you play? It's like meditation. Yeah, I, I'm you, completely blissed out. Uh, you've got grade three. Uh, <laughs> now, you see, those three, I mm. enjoy music, I want to play, I enjoy playing. If you have those three, you start the journey. And if you enjoy enough early on, you build up a kind of resource that helps you deal with the inevitable frustration that will come along. Mm -hmm. Music is, you know, you go, you have breakthroughs and then frustration, breakthroughs and then frustration. And then you stay on a kind of plateau for a while. Mm -hmm. And, and with, but, with almost any skill, it's a bit like that, isn't it? Um, exactly that. Exactly so when that. you when you get to that strange point where you actually have made massive progress, but but you can hear your own mistakes now, and and then it really feels like you're having a deep disappointment. Because, but it's actually a massive step forward because because you're beginning to really understand the new skill. And so this is the process of illusion followed by disillusion. You know, rising up, falling down, rising up, falling down. But everything we've said you can also map to the process of changing the world. Absolutely. I was, I was going to pick you up on that because the, the, that whole developmental growth mindset, that not fixing things into frames, but, but seeing how it's an evolutionary process. It's a story transforming that is both personal and planetary, and the two are linked. Um, that's really at the core of this notion of regeneration. Like the, 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 the difference of working regeneratively is to work developmentally evolutionary in that what, what you, because I also want to make the bridge to what you said earlier before we hit record, because it fits so well to this, like being a Gaia groove burger, a, a citizen or a, a, a burger being the German word for, for um, member of a community um, and, and, being in the Gaia groove, aligning with life as a transformative evolutionary process of which we have the, with which we have this bizarre relationship that we're in the polarity between being for ourselves and being as part of a larger whole, being as part of this transformation. And that's why it's an inner and outer transformation at the same time. And, and, and I think that's, well, but once we get into personally and collectively into the Gaia groove, we're, we're gonna start building regenerative cultures again. Exactly that.
So I want to pick up, I'd love to hear more from you about mm. regenerative cultures, because this is something I know you've given your life to, and you've really been at the forefront of um, fashioning concepts and presenting concepts that pe I think are so needed in our time. Um, I just got the thread of reggae harmonica in the yeah, road. Please. So I'd yeah. just like to, because this is my encouragement to you, mm. is to get, it's basically, um, I can give you a link to, it's a free course. We did mm -hmm. a series of webinars last summer. I was too busy to give much time to it, but I thought, let's just do it anyway. And it's really interesting because part of the growth mindset is the iterative process where you recognize that the first time you do something, you might not do it very well, but you don't let that put you off. And there's a saying in creativity, they say, first do it badly. You know, doing it badly is at least making a start and you learn something from doing it badly mm -hmm. that you can then do it better next time and then even better next time. So I thought, okay, let's, um, let's lean into that idea and do this course. I'm too busy, I haven't got time for it, but rather than say, it must be perfect before I do it, I thought, okay, well, let's just give it a roll and see how it goes. And it was one of the most enjoyable courses that I've run. And it was also when people did it, they say, hey, this is fun, we had a hoot. And what they did, we just got a group of people together with this, um, it's a Lee Oscar harmonica. That's the name of the firm that make it. And it, it's a particular key. It's a natural minor key in D, D natural minor. And the reason I, I say this is that with learning something the first time, you want to have an enjoyable experience early on yeah. so that you it kind of keeps you going. Yeah. And so all you need to do with this is blow and suck. And you've got the basis of reggae. So um, we do our three music grades. So grade mm -hmm. one is to enjoy it. Okay. You know, mm -hmm. if you enjoy listening to reggae music, and there's a particular thing is that you I need love to reggae. Yeah. Okay. So if you do this practice, you nod your head. <laughs> and the thing is, is when you when my beard goes down, that's the on beat. But when my head goes up, that's the off beat. So mm -hmm. if you can do this, we, and then each time your head goes up, you go, dung, dung, dung. Dung, dung, dung. And I, 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 what I do is I tap on the table when it's down and then I go dung when it goes up. Dung, 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 dung. So that's playing on the offbeat. And then all you do is you blow and suck. So I do a couple of blows and a couple of sucks. So we go. I reckon you could do that. Nice. And then what we do is um, we have this whole theme tune, which is around active hope. Mm -hmm. So this is the active hope theme tune. It goes. Um, active hope. Mm -hmm. We're doing active hope. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're doing active, active hope. hope. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're, We're doing, doing active hope. hope. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just in that, seeing active hope as something that you do yeah. rather than have. And then the baseline goes, I'll do my bit. I'll play my part. I'll do my bit, act from my heart. I'll do my bit, I'll play my part. I'll do my bit, act from my heart. Oh, we go active hope. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so anyway, I want to get <laughs> into a uh, movement. And so the pieces are reggae harmonica and the growth mindset. And if we can get people to just play reggae harmonica in the key of natural D minor, and they learn the song and i'm developing this into a pop video this is my plan you know the yeah. truth there'll be a pop video there's already first version so i've done that starting doing it badly if if you do a google for um or youtube search for active hope show three mm -hmm. um, I, I, I did this thing a while ago called the active hope show and and number three is this song, Active Hope. And I'm wanting to do a new version at the moment. I'm calling for recruits. 
And this is so, this is so brilliant, and this is so aligned with something that, um, like, for about three. Well, first of all, I need to say, um, you, you just for me you hit it, hit a home run because um, Bob Marley is probably the one person that has been with me musically the longest, from like the first album I put on myself, kind of thing. To I, I just recently put it on in the house we're moving into to open the space of the house with the, the Bob Marley live album. And, um, and I particularly like Augusto Pablo, who has this, this um, harmonica, uh, the, the recorder um, that he plays. And it, it's very much like that tune. So there, you, you, this is brilliant. And, and it relates to something that for probably about four or five years now, I've been since, yeah, since October 2016, I've been working with a wom woman called Rola Kahuri, who runs uh, the Cloudburst Foundation. And um, we, we created something called Common Earth, which helps the uh, Commonwealth Secretariat to open a conversation around regenerative development in the 54 nations of, of the Commonwealth. And, and Rola in her past has done she was a UN peace child coming from, from the Middle East and um, having worked in, in a lot of benefit concerts with, with hip hop artists and also with big artists like Sting and, and Bono and, and so on and so forth. And with her, we've been trying to get big names in the music industry involved in messaging the regeneration rising. The, the Gaia groove, the aligning with life, the, the, the deep ecology um, embodied. And um, as happens with these impulses, you, you have a few false starts. Like I almost met with Lenny Kravitz and, and then um, it, it didn't come together. And then I recently rekindled that a few, um, maybe about a year ago and met the guy who, um, who runs the Playing for Change platform. And one way to make this like turbo boost, the, this idea that you're, you're talking about would be to, to keep working on it. But when it's up, up there to, to link in with the playing for change people and maybe get a few other people to play it around the world. You know how they have the, these beautiful songs where people tune in from the beach in Jamaica or their London flat and they, they play together. Yeah. Um, just, exactly. just sort of dropping the seed. Like, let, when, when you're ready, let me know and we'll, we'll, we'll have okay. a call. So we've got a thing called Video Peel, which is a way that people can put in short videos. And mm -hmm. um, I've got a backing track that people can download to this. And it's at 110 beats per minute in mm -hmm. the key of D natural minor, um, or G minor, in fact. Um, but um, so, yeah, so we're going to be launching this quite soon as part of a free online course in Active Hope that's going to be available. Um, there's a website, activehope.info, and then soon we're going to launch activehope.training. Mm -hmm. But there's part of the training in Active Hope, and this would be something I'd love to um, share with you more about in this conversation, is this idea that we can train ourselves to get better at making a difference in the world. Mm -hmm that if active hope is being active in support of the future we hope for, um, there are skills that support that. Mm -hmm. And one of them is about recognizing where we've got an edge that says, I'm here, I can't do that there. Mm -hmm. And how we push those edges. And one of them might be, for example, taking part in a pop video. And so we're gonna do this active hope um, uh, theme tune as one of the practical projects as part of the course and get people to send in short videos of joining in but it'd be fantastic for it to spread beyond that mm. and i think there's something here about a principle of change which is find the want behind the should mm -hmm. find the want behind the should so i think sometimes working for change has all seemed a bit kind of stern and onerous but if we make it fun and i know it's not all fun i know that there's sweat you know, and there's a lot of real, um, like such awful issues that make our stomachs turn inside out. And at the same time, one of the big questions is how do we resource ourselves to keep showing up? Mm -hmm. And part of it is about having the solidarity of, you know, doing music. Music together is like glue, it joins people together. Absolutely. Um, and sure, there's different 
tastes and things, but it's kind of saying, this is part of the work of change. How do we make it attractive? How do we make it sustaining? And this is also part of regenerative culture. How do we regenerate ourselves to keep going? Because there's such a lot that we need to keep showing up for. Yeah. Now, I mean, this, this reminds me very strongly, um, I don't know if you've, you've come across this piece, um, the, you probably met May East because you now live near Findhorn. Yeah. And, and I always remember, I mean, May and I go back now, what, 20 years um, and have worked quite closely together um, in a lot of the ventures she, she launched, um, supported her with the, this UNITAR Centre, CFAL first Findhorn and then CFAL Scotland and worked with her with Guy Education. And at one point we were, running a workshop together and she shared with me something that that really relates to active hope to me and also to redefining activism um and she, basically what she said is daniel every morning when i wake up after my morning meditation i ask myself the same question and it's what do i want to activate with the power of my attention and that like for me, is a, is a redefinition of how do we position ourselves in a world where if we look at the cold linear scientific data, um, the voices are starting to be more numerous that say it's too late. It's all going to, to bits. And at the same time, we know that life isn't linear and complexity is unpredictable and uncontrollable we there are limits to what we can know and therefore even that prediction is a prediction but it might or might not come through so if we activate the story that we can undo the damage that we've done over so many millennia by changing our way of seeing and our story and our narrative. That's at the heart of what I hear when I hear Joanna Macy's telling of the Shambhala prophecy. The, 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 the punchline for me is Manu Maya, because it's mind made. Yeah? Like in, in that story, when he said the, the reason why the Shambhala warriors have the possibility of transforming is because it's mind made and what's made by the human mind can be unmade by the, by the human mind. And so if we, if we really align as activists with it, and, and what I find a bit difficult at the moment where, where the deep um, adaptation conversation has been mistaken by a lot of people in a way that it's sort of about, if you still deny that everything is in collapse and that society will fail, then you're just in denial. Uh, I don't find that a very helpful conversation because I think that beyond admitting that and fully assuming that there's a space of active hope, which, which is to say, I can act from a different place and bring forth a different world with the people I infect by this way of working. And for me, that's something that Joanna taught me 20 years ago. And, and so I find it a bit insulting <laughs> sometimes when a kind of recently activated um, deep adaptation person tells me, oh, you, you're still too positive. You, you're projecting these possible futures of regenerative cultures when everything is going to bits. Now, I, I would love to, to hear your, your take on this. Um, how can we, in full knowing that there are many converging crises and that we're in three decades of a species level rite of passage where one of the components is not knowing whether you're going to make it because that's what cooks you uh, um, again something that many years ago i remember walking with joanna in the mountains north of madrid and and asking her that question and she said daniel it's not about whether we're going to make it or whether we're not going to make it it's also about if we're not going to make it, how are we going to go out? How, how are we going to live knowing that maybe we've started processes that mean that life forms like ours might not have a future? Um, and that brings us into the moment of relationship, of celebration, of love, of, of something that Rilke saw 120 years ago when he said, give me just a little more time. So I may love the things until they're real and ripe and worthy of you. 
I feel like that's where we connect in that space beyond full acceptance of the science looks bleak, but we can still make a difference through active hope. Um, well, fantastic hearing you, Daniel. And, and also, you know, you asked my view, and I think also what you're doing is you're holding the question. And that's the question we need to keep coming back to, just holding that question. Like, we don't know, you know, we don't know whether we've blown it. We don't know whether we're too late to, and, and it's interesting, too late. Too late for what? We don't really know. And so a lot of my work is um, about um, resilience, resilience training. And I was asked last year by a group of mental health professionals in Lebanon to run a resilience training there. And they were dealing with collapse, economic collapse. Um, they've had civil war. They've been in, invaded and occupied by two neighboring countries, Syria and Israel, at different times. Um, that when they hear an explosion in the distance, it's kind of like that's not like something that's totally unusual. You know, it's kind of like, oh, we're being invaded again. Um, um, it's kind of, um, and, and on top of that, you that now have COVID. And so they said, you know, Chris, we really want to look at what does resilience look like here? And I, um, so, so we met, we met every week um, from the middle of June um, and then into July. And then we've had six sessions. And then on the 4th of August um, last year, 2020, there was this massive explosion in Beirut. Be Be yeah, I remember. Largest explosions ever with thousands of tons of um, ammonium sulfate um, fertilizer, which is, is kind of like interesting, this thing about you can start with something as a hazard, and if a hazard is ignored, it can turn into a harm. Mm. And if a harm develops, it can turn into a disaster. And if disasters aren't addressed, they can develop into catastrophe. Mm. And that, that kind of process, this had been a, a hazard for years, just lying in this warehouse in, in Beirut. And um, everyone in the group was affected. One of the people had her home destroyed. Um, and so the question is like, what's resilience look like here where you've got devastation? And one of the ideas we... Um, looked at well first thing is, is is they said thank goodness we're doing this training because this training is preparing us or has prepared us for the role that we must now play which is looking at how can we play a role in supporting um resilience in Beirut when there's so much happening that in terms of you know the uh, economic collapse the um, sectarian divides um history of civil war, there have been earthquakes, they've also been badly affected by climate change. Mm. The cedar forests, very special in Lebanon, have been um, affected by wildfires. Um, you, you know, sorry to, just as a little in parentheses, please continue, because you mentioned the cedar forest. For me, this is one of the most root stories in the history of humanity that, that the very fact that the oldest written record in existence is the Epic of Gilgamesh, which tells the story that Gilgamesh, the all-powerful king, could do whatever he wanted, but he met Humbaba in the cedar forests of Lebanon, and Humbaba told him, the one thing you can't do is cut down the cedar forest. And because he was an arrogant king, he cut down the cedar forest, and his empire crumbled because of a process that for modern day ecologists is downwind desertification. If you cut down the cedars in Lebanon, Mesopotamia will dry up and crumble. And how can we have the oldest record telling us, please, whatever, whatever you do, don't cut down the trees and then spend 5,000 years cutting down trees. But, 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 but sorry, like it, it's just because you mentioned yeah. the, the forest. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. The different threads that weave together in the story. Yeah. What what um, the group in in in, in Lebanon and Beirut um, said was that okay, our role here is to support resilience. And in the resilience training, some of the things that they found helpful was this idea of resilience as a a, a story, 
and we can, whatever we face, we can say, what does a story of resilience look like here? Um, and part, uh, core of that, I use this thing called the spider diagram, where if you imagine that this, my hand is like the body of a spider and each finger or thumb is a different way the future can go. Mm -hmm. And you can ask, say, what's the best that can happen here? You know, what would you be pleased about? What's the worst that can happen here? But also what's most likely is somewhere in between usually um, but it could be better than you'd hoped or even worse than you feared you know we don't know um, but this idea of just recognizing that whatever you face it can go different ways mm. there's better versions of it and there's worse versions of it and what active hope is about is going beyond the question what's the best what's the worst what's most likely it's about saying how do you make the best or better options more likely and the worst options less likely. Mm -hmm. And um, this thing about making it more or less likely is different from making it happen. Um, sometimes people can think, you know, solve climate change. There are the ultra optimists say, let's make it happen. Mm -hmm. And people say, oh, you can't make it happen. But this kind of, you can have an all or nothing of because you can't make it happen, what's the point? And people give up. Whereas a different view of, influences rather than control make it happen or don't make it happen a lot of these most of these issues are so much bigger than us that we can't mm. make them happen but we can make them more lightly mm. we can make climate change more lightly we can make recovery from climate change as unlikely as it might seem we can make that more lightly too and uh, this idea of um in resilience there's this kind of two-part story there's what happens and there's what happens next. And what happens next can go different ways. And our actions are like votes that influence which way things go. And in resilience, we kind of often think of like, in the beginning, there's something difficult. I think of that as the downslope. And then it's like, well, how do we have some kind of recovery, which is like finding a better leg of the spider. And I often present this as what I call it the double spider. So. There's what happens, which is often when we find ourselves on a more difficult timeline, you know, things have really fallen apart in a dreadful way. But what happens next is saying from this starting point, what do I hope for? And how can I be active in making that more likely? And that's really what active hope is about. And there's something very important about uh, starting from where you are taking an open view a clear view of your current reality so it's facing the bad news facing the difficult predictions but then saying from this difficult point what's the best that can happen from here and how do I really put myself behind that how do I become a active hope practitioner someone who engages in the practice of active hope just like some people do tai chi every morning you talked about having a meditation in the morning it, you could talk, talk about doing gardening in the morning, that these are practices that support well-being. Mm. And I just wonder, what would it be like if people did active hope every day? As a, I think of it as a spiritual practice with world health benefits and mental health benefits, mm. because actually research shows that actually when we um, live a life of purpose and follow um, addressing the directions that are important to us, particularly if we act for pro-social goals, has a strong impact on well-being. We tend to have lower levels of depression. It's interesting that one of the best predictors of suicide in any country is the level of meaning in people's lives. Yeah. Countries with a lower level of meaning, where people feel less of a sense of purpose in their lives, um, they tend to have higher suicide rates. And so I want to come back to this question of how do we respond to the possibility that we've blown it, that we are too late. And so I'd say, well, OK, spider diagram is the starting point is just beginning where we are acknowledging that things have really taken a turning for the worse. But the second part of the story is how would I like things to go from here? What do I put myself behind? And that's where there's a turning in the story from downward to upward and um you and i i know are both inspired by this idea of the great turning as a historical process of people waking up and in the new edition of active hope that joanna macy and i are working on we've been talking a lot about this how we need to 
have a shift in view of the great turning because when we talk about you know it's the historical process of people waking up and maybe in future centuries they'll look back and say this was the time of the great turning uh, i know a lot of people say I, I can't see that happening i see us just heading downhill and so what i think is important is to have a shift from outcome to process and process is what does it look like if a great turning is happening through you right now and it's bubbling yeah. um, and and the starting point of that is what well, we talk about three types of turning so the first turning is turning up with intention to play our part you know we've noticed we've noticed that things are going pear-shaped and we want to play our part in doing something about that so the first turning is i'm turning up with intention to play my part I'll play my part, I'll, I'll do my bit, I'll play my part, I'll do my bit, act from my heart. Okay, so that's number one. And then there's also, well, what do we need to turn away from? We need to turn away from wrecking our world, cutting down the cedar forests, you know, cutting down the trees that create a, a desert of our world. And then we need to turn towards, we need to turn towards Daniel, we need to turn towards you and the work that you've been doing about regenerative culture. Mm. We need to understand, like, what is it? What is regenerative culture? And how do we play a role in it? How do we take part in it? And this idea that one of the choice points available to us is what happens through us. Mm. Well, this, this is so fundamental to, like, it, I find it, like I, my whole cells were kind of firing all over my body as, as you were speaking, because it's so aligned with, with the way I've come to see this transition. And, and you know how you can tell this story in so many different languages. Um, there's a sort of indigenous deep knowledge that tells the story of participation in a great unknown. Um, I, First, like, I, I ended up going to Schumacher College in 2001 to do my master's in holistic science because I read a number of articles by Joanna, by John Seed, and by Fritjof Capra. And they all kind of coincided with talking about this place, Schumacher College, and then I thought, oh, I need, I need to go there. And um, at Schumacher College, I had this wonderful time, like opportunity to, to learn um, with a man called um, Professor Brian Goodwin. I don't know if you ever met him yeah. personally. And, and Brian is one of the really amazing, like he's a mathematical biologist, um, one of the founding fathers of complexity theory. And, and really what, what he was teaching us back then is that the whole prediction and control and manipulation proposition of a dualistic science, reductionist science of if we just have enough data, if we just understand it all better and have better models of the, how the system works, then we can predict and control it, is, is fundamentally mistaken because any system that has more than three interacting variables is by its very nature a complex dynamic system and they are fundamentally unpredictable and uncontrollable and and the one big lesson out of that is that the the proposition changes from trying to predict and control trying to work towards defined outcomes towards appropriate participation because the whole thing is in constant like the Lorenz attractor the, 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 in, in chaos that the, it, it keeps repeating itself but not quite and at every not quite you have that moment of choice where you can have a phase shift in the complex system and you jump to another level and, and you, you respond differently. And it's for, for me, this, this notion of what does it mean to participate appropriately in a larger whole that I'm actually an expression of, a manifestation of, and how do I work for, I call it positive emergence, knowing that I cannot here on Mallorca, I moved here 10 years ago because I wanted to know what would it be like to commit to a place for the rest of my life and work on the bioregional scale towards its transformation in the direction of regenerative cultures. Without any arrogance of, 
I've come here to transform this island. It's certainly beyond me to do that. But to say, how do I set the enabling conditions that allow this island to take a different route down that path of possibility? And, it, and for me, that's so aligned with what you were just talking about. The, this, how, do, how do we, and, and for me, that's also at the heart of the notion of what would a regenerative culture look like? is that shift of stopping to, to even paint the picture of that perfect regenerative community or that perfect regenerative bioregion or the regenerative future that we now design in multi-layers and whole systems design and whatever you wanna call it, as if it's a fixed state that one day we will arrive at and then we'll live happily ever, ever after and can down tools. I think that's where we're setting ourselves up for failure because what we, what we should arrive in, and it's also to do with this active hope when you don't know whether you're gonna make it or you don't know the future, is to say the journey matters and we will never arrive because we are life and life is on a continuous exploration of novelty. And in that is a dual like there's the, and also I, I learned that from from Joanna um, many years ago, and like she's really been probably one of the most influential people I've ever met on 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 my life. Um, to really accept that immortality, as all the wisdom traditions have talked about it, was never about living forever as a skin encapsulated ego. It was always about life living forever, and if we realign into that process, it doesn't matter whether we're gonna make it or not. Because if we live now in this process as the full expression of life creating conditions conducive to life, of life aligning with its own tendency to make the world a place where more life can happen, then we're in the Gaia groove. Um, then we're, we're whether then we're doing our bit exactly how we're supposed to do our bit and letting go of knowing where the story will end because we don't and we'll, we'll never know where the story will end. Um, it's, it's about living it now. Oops, you're, you're muted. I love hearing you. Um, and some words that have landed strongly with me are appropriate participation. And it's also something about um, a shift in question. So the question, will we make it? We don't know. And we brush that aside and we ask instead, well, what would we want to make? What would we want to make and how do we turn towards that? How do we appropriately participate in supporting that? And I think of um, hope that some people say, oh, well, you know, we're in a post hope era. And you know that, that they talk about hopium as somehow a misleading thing. And I know um, uh, you can use hope in 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 different ways. And um, the term around hope literacy is more like, well, how do we? Um, another term might be hope skillfulness or, or skillful hope. There are different. You can use hope unskillfully, and you can use it also more skillfully. And the idea of um, thinking of hope purely in terms of probability, like, are you hopeful? Yeah. That can become yeah. a block if people aren't hopeful. And this I learned from working in the addictions recovery field where many of my clients were post hope in that kind of way. Um, if I'd asked them, are you hopeful that you'll get well? They say, well, that's certainly not my experience. You know, I've tried stopping so many times and every time I try and give up alcohol or um, stop using drugs, you know, I succeed for a while and then it all comes crashing down and I can think, what's the point? Mm -hmm. But if I ask people instead, what do you hope for? People would tell me what they hope for. I hope to wake up in the morning without feeling so awful that I'm, you know, shaking like this unless I have a drink. It's a nightmare for me. I hope to get out of this nightmare. And so then the question comes, well, if you were to have a turning, like starting by just turning up 
with intention to play your part in this moment? You know, can you do recovery just for the next five minutes? What would that look like? What would you turn away from? What would you turn towards? And we can have the same view that moving away from, are you hopeful? My level of hopefulness rises and falls depending on what I look like, but there's a lot that makes me profoundly unhopeful but I don't let that stop me because I'm clear what I hope for. Mm -hmm. And this question, what do you hope for? Do you hope that there will still be life flourishing on this planet a thousand years from now? Mm -hmm. I do. I think, you know, I think life is just amazing. Do you hope that life will be flourishing on this planet a million years from now? Yes. And then it's a question of, well, through your actions, are you making that more likely or less likely? And our culture is making that less likely. Certainly in terms of human life flourishing a thousand years from now, we're doing extremely well at making that less likely. And this is one of the reasons why I wanted to talk with you, Daniel, because I really appreciate the clarity with which you've written about overshoot and collapse. Mm -hmm. and what I'd ask for you, one of my hopes of this conversation is just to have a video of you describing what is meant by overshoot and what that might lead to. Could you, like, just for a kind of beginner's guide, you know, um, beginner's mind kind of approach, what is overshoot? Well, one way of um, thinking of it in a, um, in a metaphoric sense is to think of an apple tree. And if you live next to an apple tree and you take the apples that you can pick every year, and I know you, you like growing fruit as well, um, um, as long as you take care of the apple tree and you maybe distribute some of the seeds that, the, that you take out of the apple before eating it, you're in a system where you're living off the interest of the, the system, to use a, uh, an economic term. You, you, you're taking annual bioproductivity and you're consuming it to do what you should be doing, which is to make sure that the system is healthy so its bioproductivity bio is the same or higher next year. The minute you start taking more than that, you, you, you literally cut into the apple tree. Like you, you, you're decreasing, you're, like you're living off your capital and not your interest. You're um, reducing the capability of the system to be flourishing the next year and provide next year. And we, as, as a human species, and really importantly, as a very small fraction of the human population, because if we blame humanity, we're being incredibly unfair to 85% of humanity who had nothing to do with pushing us into overshoot in the 1970s. My entire life, I was born in 1971, is a life of humanity in overshoot. Around about the time that I was born, compared to the global population, then humanity started to consume more than the planetary bioproductivity was provide freely it was able to provide freely and abundantly um, every year before that we lived of the in interest and then we started living of of the capital and the problem with that is that the more you do that the less life is going to be able to generate so the amount of abundance generated begins to decrease as you keep consuming more and more. And that's, that's the dead end that we're he heading towards. And I find Matthias Wackernagel's um, global footprint network and, and this notion that, that he invented of um, world overshoot day is, an, is a nice way of, of understanding how this has progressed over the years. If you, if you think that in uh, 1971, 1970 around about, was the first time that by December 28th or 29th, we had used up everything that life could produce in that year, the, the, like the, the abundance, the surplus. Um, every year that date has moved backwards. By the 1980s, it was somewhere in the region of, of November um, or, or even October, 
um, that all of humanity had, had used up bioproductivity. And now we're at a, last year was the first year that this steady progression towards earlier and earlier in the year, which for global average was in 2019, somewhere um, at the very beginning of August. We're already in, in overshoot. And some countries, if and that's also the beauty of this measure, and it's of course just a, a rough comparison, is that if everybody was consuming like a North American average consumption is or Saudi Arabian average consumption is, we're talking about February or March that we would move to that point. So again, you, you see other parts of the world not consuming quite 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 so quickly. And last year with the with the pandemic we had a slight move backwards. And our role, I think, as a, as a species, one, one rough um, measure of performance, are we, are we falling into the Gaia groove? Are we shifting from competitive scarcity to collaborative abundance, not just among our species, but with the community of life, is rolling back this Earth overshoot day year by year by year. And the pandemic has given us this blip that we actually had last year, a point of inflection where we went three days or four days in the positive direction of reducing overshoot. Um, yeah, that, is, is that what you had in mind? Very helpful. So, yeah, um, uh, yeah so I, I love growing apples. Um, it's one of my big joys in life. And so each year the apple trees grow a bit of their branches and we can think of the branches as the carrying capacity that grows apples like if you have more branches you can have more apples with a bigger tree but if say we wanted to use our apple tree not just for apples but also say for firewood you can prune a bit of branches every year mm -hmm. And it's as much as the apple tree will grow. It grows a bit each year. And so if you trim it back a bit each year, you can have some wood for your fire and also some, some apples. Mm -hmm. But if you start cutting more than the apple um, tree grows in branches in a year, then you end up with a shrinking tree. Yeah. And a shrinking tree with less branches will produce less fruit. And if that continues, then you end up with basically a dead tree that doesn't produce any fruit. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where we're heading. So exactly. what, I, what I hear you say is that um, already by February or March, the consumption rate of some countries is, is they've cut back more growth of branches than the apple tree would produce in a year. Yeah. And yet they will still want to cut the rest of the year too exactly and so and, what... and we're, we're doing that every year that they're, they're making it worse and that it's a the other measure is this global available footprint that like um when you when you divide as a fair share of global bioproductivity um per hectare you you divide up the land between all, all the humans, which again is questionable because it, it, this me measure only gives 30% of land to all other animals and 70% to humanity, which is already highly ethically questionable. But even within that, when the measure was first developed, I think we were talking at 2.1 hectares per person. By now we're talking 1.6. And part of that is that less and less is being produced because we're, we're, we're cutting the apple tree down to a stump. And at the same time, there's more and more of us. And, and so we're, we're doubly heading in the wrong direction with regard to overshoot. Yes, yes. Another image I sometimes have is of a bridge. Mm -hmm. And a bridge can cope with a certain weight. You know, well, one of the interesting things is that um, in Wikipedia, they've got a whole section on bridge disasters. Mm -hmm. And before 1900, one common cause for bridge disasters was overloading. When you had too much on a bridge, it would collapse. And they got lots of stories of different bridges that collapsed when they had too much loading. And um, we've learned what I think of as loading literacy. What is a load that a bridge can safely take before it's overstrained and might buckle and collapse. And yet, if you just continually loading a bridge more and more heavy, at some point it's gonna feel the strain. Mm. 
But what holds a bridge up are foundations and support structures. But if you start dismantling the support structures and the foundations at the same time as increasing the loading, you are heading for a disaster. A another image I play around with sometimes is if you're building a bridge from a cliff top by the ocean, how far can you build a bridge before it collapse? You know, say we deliver. build a bridge, say, from Britain over to North America. You know, how far could we build a bridge before it goes too far? And most people would recognise that you can't just keep building a bridge from one side unless it has something else to kind of meet it. Mm -hmm. um, that, and that's a way of thinking of overshoots, that you can have what's within your carrying capacity, what can be held up. But if you keep building beyond carrying capacity, then it starts to um, reach a point where it, it is likely just to collapse. It can't keep going. There, there are limits to growth. Mm. I don't know how the, any of these images sound to you. No, they, 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 I like the apple tree better because I have this general um, habit of mind of checking when I've heard myself just use a metaphor whether it was a mechanistic or an organic metaphor, um, because I, 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 organizing ideas are incredibly powerful. That's the, that's the Manu Maya bit. And the, if we use engineering metaphors, we, we project our being into an engineering world. If we use organic living metaphors, we project our being into an organic living world. And, and so, so I, I prefer the apple tree to, to, to the bridges. Um, but 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 yeah, they 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 make the same point, um, a similar point. And what's missing with the bridges is regenerative capacity. Exactly, it's the magic of life. Exactly, it's like there there is something that basically, if if you use a me mechanistic metaphor, you will get into the conversation about the second law of thermodynamics and um, the march towards maximum entropy and um, the universe running down, and. If you use organismic metaphors, you acknowledge that it's not about not like like uh, not accepting the second law of thermodynamics, but it's paying attention to the time scales at which physics works, which is these eons of time that, for human perspective and life's perspective, is just too vast. But a few billion years in that longer time journey of the universe story where life can create conditions conducive to life, where life can be working against the second law of thermodynamics. Life is as a regenerative community nested on a planetary scale from you and I being communities of various beings maintaining the health of what we call ourselves to ecosystems and the entire planet, one living structure, life is a negentrophic or syntrophic process. It temporarily, in a, on a, in a particular place, works against this march towards entropy. And, and this is this amazing capacity that we as life need to realign with. And, and, and it's also in terms of active hope, for me, um, this relates very strongly to you probably read um, a Paul Hawkins' wonderful book, Blessed Unrest, where he was highlighting all these organizations around the world doing positive things in social, ecological, and, and, and other spheres. And, and he called this the planetary immune response. And I, I think there's a deep insight in there that, that is worth sitting with more when we talk about active hope that it's not just because you were saying earlier um outcome oriented uh, like there, there's something different about working regeneratively which is not to work from the problems but from the potential of manifesting our highest calling our high our our, our gift what would the sufis say well you came into this world with written on the back of your heart that you need to discover this is my essence this is what i can share uniquely in a way that no other human being can and then to understand that in order to manifest that 
we actually need to do so in service to the next larger whole that we're embedded in. We need to do so in service to our families, our community, our, our bioregion, our, our planet. That's how, as individuals, we actually have the, the, the highest form of self-individual expression is in service to the larger bit that contains us. And, and, and for, me, for me, that's the, the, the shift towards this living regeneratively aligning into this process of how can I make health not something static that we bounce back to or resilience something that we fall out of and then we have to go back to it but continuously evolve into this dynamic process this capacity to keep responding what you were speaking to in this shift towards like redefining the great turning, not as from A to B, like, oh, what, when are we gonna get through this great transition and then we've arrived on the other side, but to really pay attention to the being as much as the doing, because the being in this non-temporal sense of being an expression of the larger doing, which is life in itself, is actually vital. And I think that's what we need to come back to much more is, is to be regeneration on all levels, to regenerate ourselves in order to regenerate our capacity to be in service to our communities and to regenerate our communities and regenerate their capacity to be in service to their bioregions and their ecosystems. Um, but yeah, in, 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 a, in a paying attention to what, how we are as as much as what we do yes yes i'm really enjoying hearing you and i'm also aware of time and i wanted to check with you what your time boundaries are and also that we don't go into overshoot yeah <laughs> but also what you'd like to do in that time and i also have an image to share with you of how i teach about resilience that's got something to do with a tennis ball and a tomato that sounds like in terms of times i i've got another 25 minutes or so um normally okay. I, I make about 90 minutes to the, these recordings um they're, they're kind of purposefully long rambling conversations that go where they want to go and and i, I would love to to hear what to tell me more about the tennis ball and the tomato. So, so sometimes people say, you know, Chris, what is resilience? Mm -hmm. And I say, well, there's, there's different stories of resilience, different ways resilience can be expressed. And one way of thinking about it is to do a thought experiment, which I invite you to take part in now, and anyone also listening to, to this, is to imagine that in one hand you've got a tennis ball, and in another hand you've got a tomato. So you're holding them both there. You might try this. And so, okay, tennis ball, and you might just squeeze a bit and see how it feels. And tomato, squeeze a bit and see how it feels. Now, what I'm gonna invite you to do is first with one hand is squeeze a bit tighter and then let go. And then with the other hand, squeeze a bit tighter and then let go. And then come back to this one and squeeze even more tight and let go. And then this hand, squeeze even more tight and let go. And then maybe squeeze really hard and let go. And then this hand really hard and let go. And what's your experience of that? What happens? Well, one hand bounces back, the tennis ball bounces back into its original shape and the tomato turns into pureed tomato in my hand and runs down yeah. my, up to my elbow. Uh, at one hand, the tomato makes a mess and the tennis ball returns to its normal shape. And mm. the Latin root of resilience is resilere, which means to spring back. And so that's how resilience is often thought, that when you squeeze a tennis ball, it has a, a, an ability, capacity to spring back into its previous shape. And I think of that as bouncing back and tremendously helpful. You know, if you've had a bad dose of the flu, to be able to get back to your normal self afterwards is like one of the miracles of nature that we have this uh, regenerative capacity that helps us return to former states after periods of disruption. And also it's interesting with the tomato because if you were outside and perhaps where you are in Mallorca or you know somewhere with soil around you and you were to do the tomato squeezing process, you could imagine 
that you could come back 10 years later and see tomatoes growing around you. Because when you squeeze, you get collapse of the tomato, but you also get release of seeds, mm. which is part of a process of regeneration, continuing fertility. And it's interesting, in fact, you don't get more tomatoes unless you get collapse. And so one term here is positive disintegration, where um, something can fall apart, but that falling apart can be part of a process of reforming later on. You might think of this as bouncing forward, um, because it's not the same tomato that you see growing around you. It's kind of growing, it's um, bouncing forward is really about um, return, but in a new and different way. Well, this this is this is fascinating because for me this is the the bit that so many people don't understand when they talk about resilience and in in many ways there's almost a parallel conversation we could have about the pathogenic and the salutogenic conception of health and I, I know you're originally a medic so that would also be fascinating to think to talk about with you but but it's it's this understanding that like okay we we have resilience we talked about bridges earlier. Uh, um, we have resilience in engineering, uh, the, the friction capacity of, of a metal that you can turn and eventually it snaps. Uh, what what it's, is the resilience? We have psychological resilience. Uh, but but the, I think the most scientific research has gone into studying change processes in ecosystems over 50 years, people like Buzz Holling and... and um, Gunderson and all, all these guys, and un understanding like the, this this notion of the adaptive cycle, this this infinity loop that is is also why I've got this thing on the cover of my book, um, is for for me a really important part of understanding resilience properly. That that what you were talking to with the with the release phase that you you actually need at different scales periodic collapse. So the patterns that no longer serve, that have been solidified in, in the system, system's evolution can actually release so new combinations of elements and relationships are possible. It's exactly what stops the system from becoming static, rigid, and therefore very brittle eventually and kind of like pre, predisposed for, for collapse. Um, is that we need collapse at different scales in order for the whole process to continue living. It's as good as death is life's ingenious way to create plenty of life. Understanding that it's not about not, no, no breakdown or no collapse. The breakdown and collapse is exactly the, what, what we need in order to keep evolving. And, and there's a, but I would also love to hear you a bit about, because you you've written a book about seven ways to build resilience. Um, so you, you think a lot about resilience. For, for me, the, the, the other big insight that I got from Gunderson and Holling's work on resilience, the ecosystems change resilience, but is that when they eventually stopped just studying ecosystems, because they began to understand that there is not a single place where you can separate ecosystem and then social system, human, things like they, they, they began their own mistake saw their own mistake that they were also in the dualistic nature culture research bit and so they started talking about eco-social systems it was their scientific way of putting humanity back into nature but in exactly that moment they also began to realize that the minute you put human beings into the system you put the capacity for foresight and ante anticipation into the system and then you have a whole new opportunity to have bounce forward or bounce beyond or transformation because it needs this. And this is also when you say, what, why are we worth sustaining? Like the, the, the big question that David Orr um, asked me that, that ultimately triggered me writing the book later. Um, our role as human beings is that we are life becoming conscious of itself. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of taking all olds to Athens. I actually want to read this bit because I think this is one of the most beautiful pieces of writing I've ever read by you and Joanna. This world in which we are born and take our being is alive. 
it is not our supply house or sewer, it is our larger body, the intelligence that evolves us from starters to interconnect and interconnects us um, with all beings is sufficient for the healing of our earth community. If we but align with that purpose, our true nature is far more ancient and encompassing than the separate self de defined by habits and society. We are as intrinsic to our living world as the rivers, the trees woven of the same fabric, the, the, of the same intricate flows of matter, energy, and mind, matter, energy, and mind. Having evolved us into self-reflective consciousness, the world can now know itself through us, behold us in its, behold it in its own majesty, um, tell its own stories, and also respond to its own suffering. That for me is, is, is the bit that we bring. That's why we're, we're worth not going out early as a, as, a, as a young species, but making it through this rite of passage and to see what, what world would we co-create once we align with that insight. Um, and what I hear you expressing is what I think of as a guy and hope. You know, yeah. that what's the best? Here we are now, and it can go so many different ways. But here's a possible way. And when I lean into that, when I give my imagination and my wondering to that, sounds like that really excites you and me too. And there's something here about the possible human. You know, what could we be? And on good days, we can show up in that way. And on bad days, we're so much the opposite. Mm -hmm. But also this thing about, okay, I'm turning up with intention to play my part. What do I want to turn away from and what do I want to turn towards? I want to turn towards the vision you've just shared. I want to turn towards the possibility that life can happen through us in ways that lead to uh, a much better expression of how things can be. And it's interesting this thing about how we look forward, because I think of resilience, that there's some Resilience is really about uh, capacity, skill set, strength um, to, that helps us face and respond to adversity. But the thing about the adversity is sometimes it's in the past, sometimes it's in the present, and sometimes it's in the future. And it's kind of saying, in this story, you know, here's me facing dot, 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 whatever it is, and what helps is... So I'm thinking like, okay, sometimes here's me facing, here's me facing, there are things that have happened in the past. There are things that are happening in the present, but also some of the biggest disasters are waiting for us in the future. It's a bit like they're in the post, as it were. You know, they haven't arrived yet, but certainly they've been set in motion, a series of processes that are sending them our way. And some people might say, well, they're in the post, there's nothing we can do. But what I'm interested in is, well, OK, whether they happen or not, one thing that is for sure is that there's different ways they can happen. There's different versions of them happening. And I'm wondering, OK, what's the best version of my nightmare? What's, if my nightmare was to turn out a way that I hope for, what would that look like? And how can I play a role in making that more likely? And it leads into a, a different view of, um, in resilience, um, one of the terms is bouncing forward. And, and, and I think of it as the transformative dip where we go down, but that changes us in ways that has benefits. And that's often thought of as post-traumatic growth. And there's another lovely term, adversity activated development. But if, if we work with this idea of adversity activated development, we can be activated by adversities that haven't happened yet, but are reasonably foreseeable. And so that leads to what I think of as pre-traumatic growth. Pre-traumatic growth is we see the crashes that we're heading towards, and that wakes us up. It acts as a wake-up call that we can do things to say, well, what can I do to make the crash less likely? You know, there might be some crashes I can avoid, and there might be some crashes where I don't know if I can avoid them, and maybe it's not likely, you know, maybe they're so much set in process that they're going to happen anyway, but there's still different ways those crashes can happen. 
And what's the best story? And I like this story of the collapse of the tomato because when the tomato collapses, it releases seeds of potential future growth. But the future growth is not guaranteed. It depends upon the right conditions. And what would it be like if we were really committed to saying, well, what are the, what's the best that could be retained of our current civilization? What would be, if we wanted seeds to grow into anything, what would we take as seeds? What would we want them to grow into? And how do we put our lives behind that? So I, I see you planting yourself in Mallorca, sort of a sense of, okay, this is a big enough um, big enough to be significant, but also small enough to be something that I could imagine influencing in a significant way. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether I will or not, but it's a great story mm -hmm. that me planting myself, you know, me as a seed or as a, sometimes it's not, or not so much seed, but we're a, a facilitative influence on seeds around us. If I was to really, um, give my life to the story of seeds planting in Mallorca of regenerative culture and I don't know what will, that will do but it's a great story I love the idea of that happening through me and this is where I love the idea of um, Arnie Ness talked about a beautiful life a beautiful life is where you are have something that's good for you and good for the world and um, I think also one of the things that's really good for us is to be living a story we have our heart in. Mm -hmm. I think one of the reasons there's such high levels of depression is because the story, main stories on offer aren't very wholesome. You know, the story of winning and losing creates a frantic race where either people are climbing to the top, worried about people stabbing them in the back who are coming up behind them. Uh, it, it sets people against each other. And the whole Trump story of me first, America first, winners, 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 you can be a winner. We don't want to, you know, his, his most commonly used insult in all his tweets is loser. Oh, you're a loser, you're a loser. He's so full of that story. But what it does is it just sets people against each other, but also creates anxiety in the people who think they're winning. And that um, it's interesting, you might be aware of a book called The Spirit Level, which looks at uh, the degree of um, uh, the degree to which their gap between the richest and poorest in any grouping. And basically, the wider the gap between the more the haves have over the have nots the wider that gap the higher the suicide rate mm -hmm. um the, and higher, the worse the health the general health yeah. exactly all kinds of measures not mm. just mental health but physical health too in a way that everyone loses mm. and so the beautiful life is saying how can i have a life that's good for me and also good for the world mm. and a, a, a theme that i'm really developing is coming back to this active hope is a practice we can engage in every day and the central notion of active help, of active hope, there, there are three. It's one is paying attention, paying attention to what's happening. So if there's a disaster happening, we're aware of it. Mm. But then it's saying whatever happens, even if we've ended up on the worst leg of a spider, things have really gone seriously pear shaped. What do I hope for from here? And then the third process is um, it's about offering a gift. I call it the gift of active hope. It's like saying, oh, what can I give to my hope? Do I like my hope? Do I love my hope? If I love my hope so much that I'd want to give something to it, what would I give? And what we give is an action or a choice. And a choice is a kind of internal action. Um, it's an action that makes our hope more likely to happen. And this is a, a well-being practice, but it's a well-being, I think of it as a beautiful well-being practice that has personal benefits and also collective benefits where we say, okay, I'm paying attention, I'm taking in what's going on, uh, I'm identifying what I hope for. And this is what you talked about, this amazing human capacity for looking forward in time, considering different possibilities and then making choices based on which ones we think are preferable. Mm. So hope is the navigational impulse 
that takes us towards preferable versions of what comes next. Mm. It, I don't know if you noticed, but when you somehow I had a real emotional response when you were talking about pre-traumatic. Um, what pre-traumatic? You can have pre-traumatic stress where you yeah. look ahead and you feel shaken and stirred and perhaps mm -hmm. traumatized by that. But also you can have pre-traumatic growth, which may follow the pre-traumatic stress. The, the pre-traumatic stress may be an activating process. Mm -hmm. And then the growth is, is where you are activated in a way that brings benefits. I, I feel like I've lived most of my life in pre-traumatic growth <laughs> to some extent. Um, first, I think it was triggered early in my life being from Germany and, and having lived through the Cold War in Germany, where um, just when I was starting to really understand start questioning the world um it was like we had the ss20 and the cruise missiles pointing at germany as the strategic battlefield of world war three in the late 70s early early 80s and um because i lived near where where the german secret service was housed it, my brother and i used to have this ever four, four year older brother and we used to talk about this the, the fact that we probably had nuclear missiles pointing at only about two and a half kilometers from where we were living and um and also like sometimes i've reflected on this with with you appreciate this with your reggae background the whole old testament daniel in the lion's den like wh why did my parents call me daniel and um, daniel saw a black stone rolling in a babylon black black stone rolling in a babylon it's it's almost um kind of strange that that i ended up with this name that is all about foreseeing that we can't continue like this and um and having spent my entire life really on in this process of, of what what does it mean to to live meaningfully in in what luther was calling planting an apple tree today even if i knew that the world was going to end tomorrow um and yeah for, for me that that's like hope like I, I love one one of my mentors i mentioned him earlier is, is david Orr, and he has this beautiful phrase you might have heard before that hope is a verb with its sleeves rolled up uh, uh, this this which for me is is another definition of active hope um that it's not a passive state of oh yeah sure we'll be we'll be fine I'm, i have a, i have hope we'll be fine eh? therefore i don't need to do anything but but this appropriate participation hope of okay, because I hope for something, I hope for life to continue, I hope for this, this magnificent story to just unfold in ways that are beyond what I could even imagine, but I want to be aligned with making that a possibility and, and living from there. Um, yeah. Thank you. Like it was just sort of pre-traumatic growth um is, is, is something i hadn't thought of um but it's it can be a powerful trigger to keep developing and it has enriched your life absolutely yeah and there's something here about the gift of active hope is both given and received mm. that we benefit in so many ways when we have the call to adventure that leads us to wake up more rather than be half asleep yeah, I really want to honour the incredible work you do, Daniel, you know, that I really see you as somebody who um, you're alert to what's happening and you've made a choice. You've made a choice. I want to show up. I want to do my bit. And that you're recognising that one of the key bits is looking at what supports regenerative processes and that how we can weave that in as the central guiding principle of our whole culture. Mm. which is about giving back being neg entropic it's like saying you know we could just say the world's going rusty and it's going to fall apart or we could also say that there's a miracle on this planet called life that we happen to be part of then the story of life is defying the odds it's defied the odds right since the very you know start of it 
the fact that we're here at all is incredibly unlikely yeah. you to say before life happened you know are you hopeful that life will happen on this dead rock that's you know really hot um you know you wouldn't be hopeful but it, hey it happened mm. would you be hopeful that these little kind of squidgy little single-celled organisms would develop in so many incredibly different ways over the history of life you, you might think oh that's incredibly unlikely that's not going to happen but hey it did happen and so what i see you speaking to is possibility and preference it's like saying there's different possibilities available and i know which i prefer and actually, it's a much better story to happen through me if I give my life to this version of events unfolding rather than this version. Absolutely. Yeah. And I love that you mentioned you bring it in connection with beauty because it is like at times when people are so obsessed because they're so obsessed with outcomes rather than the journey, the, uh, with doing rather than the quality of being in which we walk knowingly into an unknown future. Um, we we don't pay enough attention to qualities and beauty is all about quality of relationship and um, I the, the Navajo call their way of living which has been around for 10,000 years the beauty way and they have the saying of if you walk into the future walk in beauty and and for me that's that's deep deep guidance to, to how how are we because beauty aesthetics of is is relational it's about ecology it's about fitting in about appropriate participation about um being syntropic um negentropic and and so how how do we walk in in beauty um and i i mean i'm aware we're at the end of our our time but no, normally i start these conversations with with inviting the person that i'm talking with to tell a little bit about their own story. And if you don't mind, and if you have another few, few minutes, I, I would really, because it's from, I've known about you for 20 years. Um, I've, I've read The Great Turning Times in 2002, 2003. I, I, we mentioned earlier, Dream Beat is still one of my favorite CDs. Um, my first connections with Joanna and Kathleen Sullivan and some of the, the early people promoting the work that reconnects, there was always, um, burger, uh, the the Gaia Groove Burger. Uh, um, what what put you onto your story's track? Like, what what was your journey from from being a medic to um, meeting Joanna and 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 now doing the the, the work you do? Um, yes. So um, it's really interesting because. Uh, I, I often get people to kind of draw a line when they think of their journey and then mm -hmm. think about what are the important shift points along the way. So a shift point might be, I woke up in the morning and I was here. And by the time I went to bed at night, I was here. That something had happened in that day. And very often it is a conversation. It's a conversation and I think of meetings. So I think of this, this is a beautiful conversation. I'm really appreciating with you, Daniel. And this will be one of my things along the way. There's certain things I've really taken in from you about, particularly about the difference between an organic metaphor and a mechanistic metaphor. You know, it's really landed with me. And, and I, I'm really grateful to the many people along the way who've had important lessons for me. So I was lucky to have an option to do an O-level in environmental studies when I was you know, 15 or so. And to, I, as a kid, loved rock pools. And the rock pools around Brighton, where I used to go to school, had all been silted up because they'd built a marine there, a marina there, mm -hmm. and the crabs had died. And so it's like noticing impacts. Um, I used to love collecting tadpoles and, you know, little rivers, and then seeing an image of a whole river just full of dead fish floating. These are some of the images along the way that kind of landed in a way that woke me up to, hey, we're making a mess of things here. We're killing off something which is important. And then also, like you, I grew up in a nuclear shadow. I was um, uh, 
um, born about 10 years before you, but I remember when I was a student in the early 80s having nightmares about the prospect of nuclear war and of being activated by the peace movement. That was my route in and um, I became an activist as a teenager, uh, basically in the peace movement, but through the peace movement that was my political education really. Um, um, from there into the green movement and also the holistic healthcare movement as well, that these different threads work together. And it was through that my first long-term serious girlfriend, um, Anne, um, had worked with Joanna Macy in the early 1980s on one of Joanna's very first trips to Britain, um, teaching, um, as it was then, despair and empowerment work. And um, we, um, Anne and I also then went and uh, as part of our medical training, because Anne was training to be a doctor too, this is when I was a medical mm -hmm. student, we went, um, we read Joanna's book, Dharma and Development, which was about the Sarvodian movement in Sri Lanka. And we went and spent um, uh, 10, 12 weeks in Sri Lanka working with Sarvodia, mm. which was bringing together personal development, community development with spiritual development. Mm. And this kind of model that brought together personal and planetary with a larger story of what we can become. Mm. And it really took root in me. And then it was at Glastonbury Festival in 1985. I did a, a despair and empowerment mini workshop and that really touched me. And, and then, you know, there's been this whole trail. I did a intensive weekend in 1988 with Pat Fleming and Helen Taroda, where I spent an afternoon crying. And mm. it was a sense of discovery. I think what it was particularly is in Sri Lanka, I'd spent some time at a center for abandoned malnourished children and mm. seeing human starvation, human starvation, not because of illness, but because of neglect, really, you know, abandoned children, children not having enough to eat. Like it kind of really landed with me, like, yikes, you know, what are we doing? Like, it's particularly in the West, it's so easy to carry on with this business as usual in a way that just ignores the fact that hundreds of millions, I say that again, hundreds of millions of people don't have enough calories every day to meet their basic needs. And yet we just carry on as if, you know, things are fine and you get these people, um, millionaires and billionaires buying these big ocean going yachts and things, you know, as to me, that is just so sick, really sick. And so anyway, my outrage, um, but also recognizing that me being an outraged activist was somehow missing out on the psychology of the deadened response and the person I saw speaking to that and about that and exploring responses to that more than anyone else was Joanna Macy. What is it that leads us to switch off and turn away? And then that led me to working in the addictions recovery field where very similar processes are involved and it's particularly around this being a fascinated by and entrenched in behaviors that bring short-term benefits but long-term costs and seeing that process of in the short-term benefit this is very nice but in the long term um, it creates a nightmare and seeing well that's what we have and then um, hearing about the transition movement and um, it's interesting Rob Hopkins who um, and key inspirations in the transition movement him and I spent a day with Steve Rolnick who one of the key figures in an approach called motivational interviewing, which is used a lot in health psychology, to help people um, find their own motivation and capacity to move on from health harming behaviours. And that's exactly what we need. We need to look at how we have conversations that help us move on from health harming behaviours, not just health, our own health, but planetary health. And so Anyway, it's been a long, long journey. It's gone on over the last 40 years. I'm 58 now, and I see that I really kind of had some wake-up calls when I was about 18 um, that have taken me on a journey. 
that has changed my life. It's been a very unconventional life and probably like you too, you know, you can see that there were certain things that kind of got you going, but there are also certain things that have deepened mm. your um, conviction that this is so deeply important. But there are also discoveries that you've made along the way that give you a sense of promise and possibility that there are tools that you found that you've also played a role in developing and shaping and transmitting to others. And I think that's the journey that I've been on like you too, is like saying, okay, there is this mess. And like great adventure stories after the call to adventure, there's a journey of seeking out what might help, seeking out allies, implements, insights. And that's been my life. And as you get older, you gather more of them, but then also you don't want to keep them all to yourself. You want to look at how do we pass them on? And, and I suppose that's my role. I see particularly through online education to set up uh, online sources, courses and resources that help pass on the insights and practices that support our best response to the mess we're in yeah it's so aligned again like i i spent spent a lot of time with um working with guy education still do um right now not as much as as before but i'm sure there will be other phases um and if i think about what have i done in my life that really made a difference um like the opportunity to rewrite the curriculum for this online course in design for sustainability that has been taught to thousands of people all over the world, young activists who've gone on to do wonderful projects based on this very complex, large canvas map of the social, ecological, economic and worldview dimension of the great turning of designing for sustainability um, or moving towards regenerative cultures. Uh, that's been one of the things that I'm most proud of having having been been somehow part of. And but bef before we close, I just because this has been something in, in my mind since you started when you shared that you're doing this online course on active hope. Um, have you come across the work of uh, Robert Gilman and the In Context Institute? Oh, you 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 muted. Do do send me some links. Yeah, because because he, uh, Robert is a wonderful. I, I would almost recommend. I would love it. Like I'll send you some links and and, and let me know whether you want an introduction, because um, he's got this course called Bright Future Now, that he's been running for a while, and it's it's kind of going in in a similar space. And and he's been like he coined the word eco village. Um, he's he's been. In, into citizens' dis diplomacy to undo the the Cold War standoff that we that both touched us in our uh, uh, early lives. He's been, and he's an elder in, in this. Has been working on this for for fifty years, um, and um, I'm sure he would love a conversation with with you about your course because you're working on very similar um, impulses. And if I can support you with this this work. Let's let's find find ways of of having conversations like this more often because I, I really deeply appreciated this conversation. It's it's surprising to me that we might have been in the same room at Findhorn once at one of those conferences, but we that after after all these years, it's only now that we actually speak. But um, there are hopefully many more conversations to come. You were in a taxi one time, and you said hi, Chris. And I think you managed to say a few sentences and we did, that was our kind of moment of meeting but, okay. um, with David, the local taxi driver. And, yeah, yeah, um, but, true. But anyway, so I'm, I'm so pleased that um, we're able to continue and I really recognise that we are, um, you know, we're siblings in this work. We are, mm. part of, we are holding the same purposes and and i also look forward to learning more from you so Likewise. i would i would love it if um developing the active hope foundations training and i'd love to follow that up with an active hope practitioner training uh, would be more in depth and i'd love to recruit you in as somebody involved in that but anyway that's me i'm quite good at jumping off into there and I me, too. To me too me too yeah 
<laughs> and focus on the tasks in hand. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I'm really pleased that we're having this conversation. So yeah, likewise, yeah. if there's ways I can support what you're doing, yeah. help me. And final thing, next time you speak with Joanna, just give her lots and lots of love and, and just share with her from what you've got the flavor of just talking to me, how deeply she has influenced my life. Because yeah, I, I, I don't think, I often say to people, you rarely meet people where you get that sense of truly being in the presence of universe, of somehow a, an embodied presence of that larger story and and Joanna and Gigi Coyle who, who wrote the the way of counsel and Arthur Zions are the three people that always come to my mind that in being with them I've I've just felt in presence of a of a of an other way of being that that was just as informative of just being co-present rather than what we were talking about. And like sometimes when Joanna teaches, she does this beautiful Tibetan hand movement when boom. And, and I literally had experiences of feeling energetic packages landing in, in my being that I feel are still unfolding, that, that I feel she transmitted just with, with intention. So for me, she, she's and continues to be one of one of the great um, sages of our time. And, and, and I'm deeply grateful to have met her. And so, yeah, just give her lots of love from me. Thank you. Thank you. I will. And to Kathleen too. Yeah. And see you soon. Lots yeah, of love. Good. Great. And you'll just send me the links for that. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Good. Bye. Have a Bye. wonderful day.